and these slides will be shared with everyone. You can use the chat tools to ask a question live, so feel free to type something in the chat box. If you're connected with audio, great, but if you're not connected with a microphone, feel free to use the chat box. At different times during the webinar, I will pause so that I can check the chat box to see if anyone has any questions, and I'll try to answer those questions. Another thing that I'm going to ask is that if you would mute your microphone, if you have one connected, I'd appreciate it. If not, if it gets too noisy, I'll start muting um, different people to identify where the source of the noise comes from. Sometimes um, folks tell me that it gets a little noisy, so that helps out a lot if you mute that microphone. You can also dial in using your phone. So you'll see the number displayed, and um, there's also an access code. So be sure to pass that information on to anyone who may be trying to join in. So what are Google Forms? So let's get down to the basics and the fundamentals here. Google Forms is a free tool from Google, and it's also part of a personal account, and it's also part of our educational domain with Google, and it allows you to create forms, surveys, and quizzes. The nice part about Google Forms is that you can share the forms with others. And you can also allow other people to complete the forms completely online. I really love that you can connect all the, or collect all of the responses in one spreadsheet. And Google Forms will provide you with a helpful summary of the collected data with charts and graphs. So that's how we really get into the assessment piece and the data piece as well with Google Forms. Google Forms can be accessed a couple of different ways. One way is to go through Google Drive or to go to forms.google.com. So I'm going to pause and allow you to either access your Google Drive or to go to forms.google.com to access it. And typically what I do from my Google Drive is simply to hit the New button on the left side select more, and select Google Forms. Oh, I got it. And as you can see, it brings you to a brand new Google Form that you can begin to work with. Oh, I can hear now. Oh, great. <laughs> All right, I think we just got someone connected and able to hear everything. I also can use forms.google.com. The nice part about going into Google Forms this way is that it shows you all of your recent forms in a block or grid view, and then it also takes you to the template gallery. And I think that the template gallery, in terms of Google Forms, is a resource that is underutilized. You do not have to start Google Forms from scratch, which I think is pretty awesome. You can use a blank form, of course, if you want to build something um, and customize it, but you can also select from the types of Google Forms templates that are available. For example, there's a blank quiz, and it gets you started, but you can begin um, with a description, a title, and begin by modifying a question that's already set up, but the settings on this is already um, ready to go for it to be a quiz. Here's another example, here's the exit ticket. And the exit ticket example is ready to go with things like um, questions such as name, email, one important thing you learned in class today, did you feel prepared, why or why not, and so on. I, these um, questions can be really effective with students when you want them to self-assess or when you want to reflect or even when you want them to give you a little evaluation of your teaching during a class session. Another pretty popular option is the assessment option. And again, you've got a template already ready to go with different question styles. And all you have to do with the template is just fill it in with your information. So you have a short answer question, a checkbox question, and then a multiple choice question. 
So that forms.google.com page will take you into the templates and it'll allow you to look at all of the different um, templates that are out there. And you can see the ones on top have to do with classroom teaching and assessment, but you can see that under the personal section of the templates, you can find even more templates. All right, any questions so far? All right, great. I'm going to move over to my HyperDoc, and we've talked so far about what Google Forms are and how to access them. I'm creating Google Forms. It's pretty straightforward. Um, you can start from a template, start with an untitled form, give your form a title, Okay. Start with a question. Meet. All right, so the, my question on this one is what days can you meet? Um, notice that I just repeated the title of the form and notice that um, Google Forms has really added in this really nice machine intelligence lately so that when you start typing a question in Google Forms, it starts giving you these suggestions. It not only suggests the type of question for you, but it also begins to suggest the options which I can add those all in. And um, I didn't even have to go through and type each one. Notice that at the bottom, there are a few options. I can duplicate a question or I can get rid of a question. I'm going to add one more question to this form. And notice I've got a control box that's on the right side that allow me to add questions. For example, if I want to collect information like the person's name, I can add that in. See how when I said first name and last name, it automatically knew that I'm looking for um, a short answer, and it just set the question up for me. So Google Forms is a product that just keeps getting better. They keep adding more and more features to Google Forms to make it easier for um, you to use them across the board, classroom and in the office as well. Notice that the title of my form populates the uh, title bar on the top left side. And I've also got some controls that are to the extreme right side of the page. So I've got the control bar to the right and then additional controls across the top. And we'll talk about some of these. Here I can add questions. I can add a title and a description. I can add images from a Google search. or I can add YouTube videos. So I can do a YouTube video search or include a URL of a video to include in a Google form. The last option that I have here is to add a section. So you can break up your questions, especially um, if it's an assessment, you can break them up into sections by adding a section. And it'll allow me to create an entirely different section of questions on this Google form. Notice that I'm not saving anything in terms of this Google form. Everything is saved in my Google Drive. So when I go back to my Google Drive and I hit my most recent files, there's my Google form that I just created. Okay. So creating Google Forms is one thing to get started with. You can also choose where responses are going to go. So I can um, go over to my responses and I can make sure that I have the responses turned on and then I can also determine if I'm going to create a spreadsheet. So even before I send out the um, Google form, I can create a new spreadsheet for the answers 
or I can select a spreadsheet that I already have to determine where I want responses to go. And as you can see, it automatically sets up a Google Sheet for me. I don't have to go in and do that, and it gives it the title of my Google form. The next thing you'll want to think about is how to send your Google form out to other people. And to do that, you have to take a look at your form settings. And you, there are a variety of settings that you can use. And you can also use the send button, button to take a look at that. So let's go back to my Google form. And let me go back to my questions. And you may be able to see at the top right that I've got some settings. And I can do things like collect the email addresses of the people who fill out the form. I can also restrict this form just to people who work in EBR and who uh, are at schools in EBR. I don't have to allow anyone outside of the district to use this form. That does require that um, folks sign in with their EBR accounts before they can access this form. And I also have the option to do things like let users edit their form after they submit it or to see a summary of everyone's responses. There are also presentation settings, which um, many of these have been added recently, which, which is really nice. You can um, show a progress bar, especially if you have a long survey, or show a link to another response. And you can also customize a confirmation message. And finally, under settings, you can set up quizzes. And we'll talk about quizzes in just a little bit. To send your form out, it's just as easy as clicking the Send button and then determining how you would like to send it out. You can email a form out to specific people, or you can get a hyperlink and share that. The hyperlink is easily shared on a website, in an email, or through um, electronic communication. You can also shorten the URL as well so it's not so long and unwieldy. The third option you have is to embed your Google Forms. And um, Google Forms are easily embedded in a website if you have one or in, say, in Canvas. If you're building a module in Canvas, you can embed using this code right here. All right, so I'm returning to my HyperDoc. Any ex um, questions so far? Okay, what I'd like you to do at this point, I'm going to pause, and for a little interactivity, I've got a Google Form example. It's called the Simple Google Form Example, and I want you to click on that and fill out the Google Form. So I'm, I have one question, and I want to know, what is your background with Google Forms? Let me know if you are unable to access the form. The hyperlink is on the top of the screen, and here's the form. Okay, and I can already see that I have a few responses. All right, I'm going to pause for a couple minutes and just let you respond. All right, and I'm putting that document URL in the chat box. And let me make sure that everything is turned on and accessible.
All right, I can see. I also put the direct link in, and I see a few people are filling it out at this point. Okay, I'm going to flip over and I can see more responses are coming in. And I can see already that I've got um, a lot of people who have some knowledge of Google Forms. I've got a few people who are beginners and maybe getting started and are curious about Google Forms. So it gives me a great um, assessment of the group and where we're going and maybe where I need to go with the rest of this presentation. I could also flip over and look at an individual response. And I could also go to my spreadsheet, create a new spreadsheet, and then also check out the responses that way as well. Now notice in the summary, I don't know who said what. I don't know who's um, the expert and who's the beginner. I'd have to go to the individual responses to look at that. But just looking at the summary gives me a lot of great information. And you can see the responses um, are changing in real time. Okay, any questions so far? One of the things that I know that I found um, pretty challenging about Google Forms at the beginning when I started using them, well, for one thing, there were all of these different question types, and it's not always obvious in terms of how to use all of them. Um, some of them are, and some are a little fuzzy. So one of the things that I've included in the HyperDoc is just a little cheat sheet to give you some thoughts on when to use what question. Um, for example, short answer, open-ended response, but it's not too long. Paragraph, you want the um, students to elaborate, or you'd like your respondents to elaborate in response to your question. The only thing I'll say about paragraph questions is be careful without a rubric or a guide. Um, grading these questions, if you're giving a classroom assessment, can get a little messy. If you do present students with a paragraph, make sure that you have some kind of guide. Um, since Google Forms doesn't summarize the paragraph responses in, um, in that summary. Multiple choice, we're used to using multiple choice questions. You want students or you want to send out a survey, you'd like a single option selected. You're offering one option, there's a single correct answer, for example, and you don't have that many options. And for every question type, I've got an example that you can, that's clickable. And I've also, some of the questions have, um, forms have tutorials as well. Okay, so check boxes. Figuring out when to use the check boxes, drop downs, linear scales, and multiple choice grids might not necessarily seem obvious to all of us right out, out of the gate. For check boxes, what I have found through experience is that this is a good option to use when you'd like to offer students more than one option and there might be multiple correct answers and you want students to demonstrate some higher order thinking, but you'd like them to do that pretty quickly. So in a, in a check box type situation, you want them to go in and select multiple options and um, be able to do that pretty fast. In the drop downs, you've got many, many options and you only want one response. So your form would start getting pretty long if you typed each one of these out in a multiple choice question. But you want um, your respondents or your students to be able to pick from a long list of options. Let me jump back on that checkbox for a question for a second. Um, let me edit this one. Of the week. So that what days of the week question that we started out with, that was a checkbox 
option and notice that it automatically gave me a checkbox to begin with and suggestions and notice that a, a checkbox question is typically one where there might be multiple selections so you might respond to this question by indicating that you could meet on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then there's the linear scale. The linear scale is a great option when you want students or respondents to give you um, an answer along a single dimension, like how well did you understand today's lesson, and you want them to rate themselves maybe on a scale of one to five. Um, in this example, the question is how difficult was the quiz? And it will allow you to collect some data really quickly from the students about whether or not they thought the quiz was very easy or very difficult or somewhere in the middle. And then one more choice that I'd like to talk about is the multiple choice grid. And you can click on it and see an example of that. The multiple choice grid looks a little bit scary and daunting, but really once you do a couple and um, you check out the tutorial that's linked here on the Google form, you'll see that they're not too bad. What a multiple choice grid does is that it just sets up a list for example, which Google apps would you like to learn more about, and some columns. So what that looks like on the back end is that I have, a, I have a row, and that's my list of Google apps, and then I have a column where I want the user to indicate yes or no that they'd like to learn about that app. And that sets everything up into a grid. So when you've got a list of selections and you'd like for your users to make a choice about each one, the multiple choice grid can be a great option. And I don't want to overlook that there are some additional, additional options as well. You can also give users questions where they indicate the date and also the time and those pretty much set up automatically. And there's also the file upload, and we'll talk about the file upload in just a little bit as well, how you can use the file upload. Any questions so far? For every one of these examples that I've posted, feel free to, to make a copy of it and play around with the questions. For example, here's the linear scale. And notice that you have the, I could have made this a zero, a one. You have the option to play around with the linear scale and make some changes. The default is one to five, but you can change that. Your anchors are totally set by you as well. All right, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the examples and some benefits of Google Forms and then allow you to reflect a little bit, maybe to explore some of the examples and some of the tutorials and just answer questions. Benefits of Google Forms, one benefit is to allow you to gather data quickly and easily. So here's an example of a form that I've sent out and used before where I included things like um, name, a lot of ratings, and then some um, check boxes. And I'll show you what that looks like from my view. All right, so once I gather up all the data, I get a lot of good information about students' knowledge of different apps. And again, insert your own ideas or your own content, your own grade level. Think about the levels of the students that you have. Notice that by default, everything is displayed in terms of percentages. 
And so um, in this particular group, I'm able to see that about half the respondents were fairly knowledgeable about Gmail. So that told me right there that I didn't have to spend a lot of time um, working with them on Gmail. I, but on the other hand, with Google Drive, I can see there was a big split. About a third of the participants were fairly knowledgeable about Google Drive, but there were quite a few people, the other two-thirds, um, wanted more information about Google Drive. And the same thing with Google Docs and Google Calendar. So just giving um, students the opportunity to let you know about their background knowledge is one way that you can use Google Forms, or one way to get started using Google Forms. Another example, here's an equations form that I created to allow students to um, give me some information about their, their knowledge of equations. And the nice part about this one is that it was it's actually set up as a quiz, and it allowed me to see things like the average, the median, the range, the, um, the frequently missed questions, and then also the answers that were selected, and that gives me a breakdown on the percentage of time that that answer, the correct answer, was selected as well. Many teachers also use Google Forms to allow kids to reflect and evaluate. Here's an example. This is a Google Form set up just to allow students to kind of reflect on their conduct in class, whether or not they've been participating, whether or not they've been doing homework. And so a teacher could gather that information and then develop a plan for the class or customize the classroom management plan to better target um, the needs and the concerns that the students have. Another feature, and I mentioned this just a few seconds ago, are the self-grading quizzes and tests. So here's an example of a self-grading quiz, and what I'll do is I'll stop and let's have a little interactivity. I'll send this one out to you and let you complete it. Okay, so the form is in the chat box. And if you would fill it out. Get a few wrong if you if you like as well on this one. No judging. All right, and I see responses are coming in. I'm going to preview this form just to show you. This is an example. You would put in your name, select a response, and when you hit submit, you get a link to look at your score. From the standpoint of being the student, I then get immediate feedback. on whether or not I understand um, the concepts or the content covered in this little quiz. Hang on, let me get somebody who would like to um, have a, a copy. All right. And I also get the benefit from the teacher side. I get the benefit of being able to see who responded, the responses that people had. So great, I had a split here. Four people um, with one answer, four with another. I love, as a teacher, I love splits because those are conversation starters. Um, I love having students talk about why they selected one answer and then allow students who selected a different answer to talk about what they were thinking about or what they thought the question meant to them. Okay, so again, when I've got a spread out set of responses like this one, 
almost three, three, and three on all three different responses. That's another great conversation starter for the classroom. I can have the students who selected Carson City to talk about how they know they have the right answer and then to allow the other students in the class to have a voice as well and to tell me about what they were thinking about or what um, evidence they used or what they thought the question meant. And then, of course, if I want to get into individual responses, I can drill down to the individuals just by going to this individual tab. And I can start looking at what individual students did and their performance. The way to do that or to set up the self-grading quiz is under the settings. And we talked about the general settings and the presentation settings. And I told you there was a third set of options, and here it is. These are the quiz options. And I have the option with the Google Form to make it a quiz and to make it self-grading by assigning point values to the questions and the, self and the auto grading feature. This one is um, fairly new. It came out towards the beginning of the 2016-17 school year. And I now also have the option to either release the grade to the student immediately or to give the student feedback after I have a chance to review the, the quiz. If I had placed any short answer or paragraph um, questions on this quiz, I might turn this option on so that I would be able to manually review those responses prior to releasing the score. Teachers also have the option to allow kids to see their missed questions their correct answers, and also their point values. And all of that is just feedback. And the feedback, as we all know, is one of the most powerful agents of behavior change um, in the classroom. All right, any questions about the self-grading quizzes? So any form that you set up can become a self-grading quiz or if you recall back from the beginning of the webinar, I mentioned that if you go to forms.google.com, you can select that blank quiz from the template gallery. And that one has the settings done for you automatically. Okay, I've got um, in the chat box, this is Ms. Arsenault, I'm going to swap the um, presentation over to her for a sec and I'm going to let her share something that she thought of about self-grading quizzes. Hey, I don't, I, um, I love this presentation, it's awesome. I've learned a couple of things myself. I okay. did run into an issue. Yes. Um, at one of the schools, I, uh, one of the teachers was trying to use the self-grading option and, um, she had some questions that were text-based questions, and so she okay. selected that option. Um, let's see, I'd have to pull up my own, so I'll know what I'm looking at. I can, I can switch selected. it over so that you can show your screen to us as well. Hang on. Uh, okay. Here we go. I'm going to send you a um, presenter request, and it may ask you to download the little plug-in. Got it. Okay, so she had set up her <laughs> she had set up her uh, Google form to um, return the grades after review, basically. And my plugin's still running, but I'll kind of okay. chat while it's running. Okay. But um, is it showing my screen now? Not yet. Okay. Um. Okay, so basically when she went in and she went to her settings and her quizzes mm -hmm. and she chose to make it a quiz and... Oops. Okay, let me stop sharing. Okay. I think we lost your, we lost your audio, Keisha.
Okay, I think I have it okay, now. Great. Very good. I'm so sorry. That's all right. I just we had an issue at one of the schools where um, a teacher was doing an awesome job of utilizing this tool. And when she went in, she did quizzes. She used that later after the annual review. And then when she tried to return the students' uh, grades, it, it wouldn't allow the students to access their grades. Basically, it's trying to use Gmail. Hmm. And, um, and so we had to kind of like find a workaround for that. So what we're doing, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, because it's kind of experimental, trying to find a workaround. We still chose immediately after each submission, okay. even though she had to go in and grade them. And so she would go in and grade them, and then the students would simply click the link to the form after she had graded it. Okay. And because it had, because they were logged in, it sent them to, it it gave them their grade. Okay. If that makes sense. Right, so it sounds like it didn't send it to um, an email. So do you think that it possibly could have had something to do with the settings in terms of whether or not they were able to view the form multiple times? I just, when she tried, I mean, again, it's experimental mm, at this definitely. point. I haven't, I haven't played with this feature like a whole 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 lot because I don't have my own classroom anymore but when she had later after manual review selected and she went in and graded it it, it was trying to it seemed like it was trying to email the students mm -hmm. and because we have Gmail turned off she could never really return their grades to them wow okay so instead the kids just went back instead from now on she just always selects immediately after each submission okay and and so like if she, when she shared the quiz, she would share it in her Google Classroom, like the link for it. So if they took the quiz and then she graded it overnight, the next day, um, the kids would just click that exact same link again. Okay. So I'm and thinking that um, maybe that has to do with, so we're here under the quizzes and mm -hmm. um, so that manual review button right here, turning on the email collection, so maybe that did not work out the way that um, it was intended because it's going to turn on that email collection and that piece is not um, turned on for the students. So to re in terms of great release, she had to go ahead and do and select that first option, right, immediately after submission. Yeah. Okay. Even though you're going to go in and manually grade it, right. that's what you still need to select. Okay. That's, a, that's good to know. So for, for teachers who are going to um, allow, um, put in those questions that have short answer or paragraph um, dimensions to them, it's still a good idea to go ahead and turn on that immediately after submission um, release on the grades so that um, students will be able to, to see the, um, the grades after submission, but then also be able to go back and see the um, short answer and paragraph grades as well. All right, um, branching questions can allow the teacher to um, kind of differentiate or even reteach with, with Google Forms. Now, you may not want to try to start off using Google Forms this way, but this is something that you can think about and I want to get you thinking about. Um, you can have your Google Forms set up so that it uh, shoots the student or the respondent to different sections based on their answer. So what I'm going to do is send this one out. I'll send you a link to it in the chat box and I want you to try it out and let me know what you think. The way that this one is going to work is that, and of course this is an oversimplified example naturally, but Depending on the answer that the student selects for the first question, it's either going to shoot them to, so if they select the correct answer, it takes them to the next, immediately to the next section, or if they select the wrong answer for the first question, it takes them to a section which will provide some remediation. So if I have a student in my class who does not know that we're in Baton Rouge and that we're in the capital of Louisiana, it, and they select the wrong answer, it will take them to some remediation. So I've got a video that I've inserted to um, have the student watch that. And then 
go back to the question and have them answer. And if they answer it correctly this time, they would go on and take the rest of the quiz. If they continue to have problems answering the question correctly, the quiz would basically stop. It would submit at this point. And that's um, a student that I know that I would probably meet with during small group time or set up, um, set them up to meet with me during small group time during the next class session. So play around with this one. And as you can see, let me pull up a fresh um, copy of it. So what I've got is I've got an introduction and a section, and I'll hit the edit button so you can kind of get a look at what's behind this. I had this quiz has three sections. The introduction, this is kind of the gatekeeper question. This is the question that I want to determine whether or not I need to uh, provide some remediation to the student or to differentiate my instruction with the student. The first one, if they, if they get this one correct, they're going to move on to section two, and here are the section two questions. And section three, as you can see, this is the, the reteaching or the remediation section. It, it's hiding and it does not become active until or unless the student has a problem with that first question. And so you might be wondering, how is this set up? So it's just a multiple choice quiz question. And you see these three dots underneath the question? I selected the option to go to the section based on the answer. And so for each, when I select that option, each answer or response choice then has its own command that goes with it. So if the student selects the incorrect answer, they select Austin, it's going to take them to that remediation section or Sacramento, it will take them to a little remediation, but if they get the right answer, it goes to the next section automatically. Then down here in the differentiation, I've also got the option for go to section based on answer. And if they get it right this, on the second try after the remediation, then it, they can also um, go back to the first section and start the quiz again, or if they get the, the answer wrong again, then it submits the form automatically. Um, that's a student I'm going to meet with individually during small group time. So Google Forms can really help you um, identify those students that you're going to meet with on an individual basis, or maybe provide a little reteaching or a little help to some students that can move on just with a little boost. Another example of using quizzes is that when you go into that answer key, you might have noticed that you got some feedback. So to set that up, on that question, what is the capital of Nevada, I simply went in and selected the feedback for the correct answers, and then I also get to set up feedback for the incorrect answers. So answer key and add answer feedback. And I can put in some feedback for any answers that the students get correct, and then also some feedback for the correct answers. I could even add in a hyperlink that would take them to a video, a worksheet, um, a study help, a study guide, if they um, get the question incorrect. And you'll notice that under the Capital of Nevada question, if you selected the wrong answer to that one, you got some feedback and you even got the option to go in and play a States and Capitals game on Quizlet. So just one more way that you could set up a short Google form and then use it to differentiate. All right, um, images and videos. So on this particular form, this is just a, a, a YouTube video. 
brought in. So add video, and then you could um, either do a YouTube search or a URL. Search for a video, and then add in a video right into the, the Google form. You have the option to align it or to remove it. And there's your video. A lot of teachers um, do send students assignments both inside and outside of Google Classroom using a video and some questions. It's also a great way to get students used to answering questions about video and used to actively watching videos. There's a new feature in Google Forms called File Upload. This one was added about a month or two ago. And when you create a file upload question, I'll just show this one. It allows you to select that file upload option. So you could have a give students a project, select the file upload option in a Google form and have students upload their Google um, upload their files to the project. You get an automatic date and time stamp of when they upload their projects. And you can even manipulate the number of files that you want them to set up so it can be multiple files or one file. You can set a file size. And you can determine what kind of files you want students to upload. So if you're concerned about what students might upload and the size of it and so on, you can set some restrictions on what they can upload. Or you can allow everything. So a new feature in Google Forms is to allow you to collect uploads through Google Forms. And so when you think about it, it's just one more way that Google is getting just that much closer to providing us as teachers with all of those features of a full-fledged um, learning management system. All right, any questions? I think let me check the chat box and see if we have any, any thoughts on that. Right, um, you guys are loving the immediate feedback, the potential for RTI, I agree. Um, it may take a little while to build up your collection of Google Forms, but once you do, you're going to find that you're gonna gather some great information and really be able to um, supercharge your RTI. Um, Ms. Arsenault mentioned that uh, Lee High School is using a Google form that allows students to um, provide tips about things like bullying. Um, if they observe behavior on campus that needs reporting, they submit it by way of a Google form. And with the upload feature, they send, they send uh, photos of things around the campus that they want to report. So very interesting use of, of Google forms. Um, one thing I haven't talked about yet are add-ons with forms. If you come over to the right side, there are three dots for more options, and it will allow you to add more features to your Google Forms. I don't use a ton of these, but there's a few that I think that are really outstanding and are worth looking at. One is called um, Form Notifications. I use this one on a daily basis. It lets me set up email notifications for my form. So whenever someone fills out my form, I immediately get an email to let me know that um, someone's filled it out. So to activate, once you add that add-on, to activate it, you go to the puzzle piece and Form Notifications configure the notifications, and then every time someone, a student or a respondent would fill out this form, it would give me um, a notification to my, my email. And I could send that for every, each and every one or maybe just after a certain number. Another one you might be interested in is called Awesome Table. And Awesome Table um, generates charts based on Google Form responses. And it kind of gives you a, um, a, builds a summary. It does a lot of the same things as a summary, but it'll also create pie charts and, and additional charts. Sometimes I've, I use this add-on as well, GMath for Forms, and it allows you to create equations, graphs, and math quizzes into Google Docs 
sheets, or forms. And so I've got a hyperlink to that one. If you're a math teacher and you're wondering how would I get a graph in here or some equations, GMath for forms. Okay, a couple more things I'm going to point out and then I'll just stop and allow you to ask questions. One I've got is the link to the webinar folder. Make sure you check that out. It's got copies of all the examples and samples. And then I've also got um, a helpful website. The website is Ditch That Textbook which is awesome because it's dedicated to providing teachers or sharing resources that allow you to go beyond the textbook and to integrate technology in innovative and engaging ways. So the link is included at the bottom of the hyperdoc and it's Ditch That Textbook and it's a wonderful website created by a guy called Matt Miller. All right, so <clears throat> That's it for me. I hope that what you've gotten out of this webinar is a jump start in terms of Google Forms and maybe even if you know how to use Google Forms, maybe some ideas for how you might begin to use them a little differently. I hope that you will consider differentiating in your classroom using a Google Form. Set up one that's very simple and work your way from there. I hope that you try the self-grading feature because it's an awesome, awesome um, feature that's been added into Google Forms this school year, and it really allows students to get that feedback quickly. So at this point, if you have any questions, if you would put them in the chat box, I'm going to be around for a little while, and I'll just be answering your questions. Make sure that if you sign in with the, um, to today's webinar that I have your name somewhere in the chat box or somewhere so that I can award you one CLU for participation today. All right, thanks to everyone for being such a great audience. And I want to let me see if I send a couple of shout outs. Ms. Bobby Reed from Accountability, Accountability and Assessment, welcome. Ms. Square. I'm not exactly sure where Ms. Square is, Ursula Square. She might be at any school in the district offering support to teachers. Ms. Jessica Brister, welcome. I'm so glad you were able to participate today. Um, let's see, Ms. Arsenault is still on, Ms. Tamika Warner, Ms. Colson, and also Dr. Rutledge. <clears throat>